Okay, the final item of business uh, this evening is a member's business debate uh, on motion 2909 in the name of Stephen Kerr on commemorating the 70th anniversary of the accession to the throne of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I invite members who wish to participate to press the request to speak button and I call, <coughs> I call on Stephen Kerr uh, to move the motion for around seven minutes. Deputy Presiding Officer, it is a real honour for me to open this debate commemorating the 70th anniversary of the accession to the throne of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, an occasion we celebrated together as a nation on Sunday the 6th of February. For the past 70 years, Her Majesty has been the Head of State of our United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, Crown Dependencies and British Overseas Territories and the Head of the Commonwealth. Throughout her reign, she has continuously displayed the true virtues of leadership, duty, sacrifice and service. And while Sunday was a day of national celebration, for Her Majesty it would have been a day of mixed emotions, as it also marked the 70th anniversary of the passing of her father, King George VI. The then Princess Elizabeth was in Kenya with her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, when her father suddenly passed away. The next day, the now Queen Elizabeth landed in London and was greeted by the first of 14 Prime Ministers to serve under her, Sir Winston Churchill. According to the historian Dr Kate Williams, Sir Winston Churchill initially thought that the Queen was too young and inexperienced to be Head of State, with his saying, she's just a child. This is despite Her Majesty already being the mother of two children. Through paying attention to detail, hard work, dedication and professionalism, Her Majesty ensured that Sir Winston Churchill would have to change his mind, and he did. During her 70-year reign, Her Majesty has shown us that the best virtues of leadership are service and selflessness. True leaders prioritise the cause they are serving over personal interests. Her Majesty's dedication to uphold the national interest can be seen in her behaviour during the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly after the death of her late husband of over 70 years. Last month, various publications noted that Downing Street had offered Her Majesty an exemption to the strict rules that were in place for funerals. According to these reports, Her Majesty declined, saying that not only was this exemption unfair for everyone else in the country that had lost a loved one during the pandemic, but she wanted to set an example for the nation. Even at one of the most difficult and painful moments in her life, Her Majesty put the national interest first and showed true leadership, not through words, but through action. The spirit with which Her Majesty undertakes her duties as sovereign can be summed up with the letter that she published to mark the beginning of her Platinum Jubilee. The focus of the letter was about the future of the Crown, asking the British people to give her son, the Duke of Rothsey, our full support when he becomes king. The letter also reflects on the importance of partnership, with Her Majesty reflecting on the loving support the Duke of Edinburgh gave her during their marriage. It was on this reflection that Her Majesty announced that she would like her daughter-in-law, the Duchess of Rothsey, to become Queen Consort when Prince Charles becomes King. Her Majesty turned an occasion about her into a moment to support others and ease succession to the throne, highlighting the selflessness which has been the, a core characteristic of Her Majesty's reign. Her Majesty signed off her Platinum Jubilee letter with the words, Your Servant. This says it all. In recent decades, leadership has often been associated with assertiveness, popularity and calculation. Her Majesty reminds us that this definition is false. Service is at the heart of leadership. And it is this service which allows Her Majesty to unite our country in a way that no politician ever can. During the COVID-19 pandemic, despite thousands of speeches given by numerous politicians, the speech that the British people remember was the one given to us by Her Majesty. In her speech, Her Majesty focused on unity, saying that if we remain united and resolute, then we will overcome it. Her Majesty also reflected on the virtues that characterise Britain, self-discipline, 
a quiet, good-humoured resolve and fellow feeling. Every politician in our United Kingdom, regardless of political party, has a responsibility to uphold these virtues. One of my favourite quotes from King George VI is, the highest of distinction is service to others. And over the past 70 years, Her Majesty has shown she is the perfect example of her father's words. Some argue that the concept of monarchy is antiquated, but Her Majesty has shown that it is needed more than ever. With the loving support of her late husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, Her Majesty has modernised the royal family whilst upholding the values that we are proud of as a country, duty, sacrifice and service. And in these times of division, nobody can unite our country the way that Her Majesty does. Talk surrounding the royal family is often portrayed as the person is cast aside for the interests of the crown. Her Majesty the Queen turns this narrative on its head. It is because of the personal qualities of Her Majesty the Queen, the qualities of duty, sacrifice and service, that the crown prospers today and will continue to prosper in the future. A platinum jubilee is a once-in-a-lifetime event. In the months ahead, may people across Scotland and across our United Kingdom celebrate it accordingly, remembering the personal service of our remarkable monarch. God save the Queen. Thank you, Mr Kerr. I now call on Audrey Nicholl, who will be followed by Alexander Stewart for around four minutes. Ms Nicholl. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I congratulate Stephen Kerr on bringing this motion forward today, celebrating the 70th anniversary of the accession to the throne of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II of England and the first Queen Elizabeth of Scotland. Regardless of our differing views on the monarchy in a modern-day Scotland, this debate is rightfully a moment to celebrate a unique achievement by a woman who has given her life to serving others, reflected in the fact that she is the longest reigning Queen living and the longest reigning monarch living. Last week, the Platinum Jubilee celebrations got underway across the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth and around the world as communities came together to celebrate the Queen's 70-year-long reign. And I'm sure many loyal fans and royal watchers will be relieved and, at, and hopeful that the pandemic will not inhibit the celebrations. Anticipating the popularity of the debate today and the likely reference by many members to the number of countries the Queen has visited, miles she has travelled, trees she has planted, hands she has taken, and hats and handbags she owns, I shall instead take a brief walk back in time. My first memory of the Queen was a Sunday drive in our family Austin A40 from my home in Aberdeen to see the Queen's holiday home. Balmoral Castle. And while my sister and I could only see the roof of the castle from the road, that was enough for us. We were in awe. During the 70s, 80s and 90s, my family were true royal fans following every wedding, birth, christening, divorce, death and scandal. The connection the Queen has to the North East is lifelong. It is not unusual to encounter her walking, riding or driving around Deeside clearly at home and always wearing her headscarf. My husband, then a serving police officer, returned from Deeside security duties one evening, advising me that he had to apologise to the Queen earlier that day after blocking her in on an estate road as he and his colleague assisted a royal watcher changing her flat tyre. And graciously, the Queen had offered to help. Throughout my own working life, I too spent many hours undertaking security duties uh, when royals were in residence. Many royal watchers arrived at numerous venues where she was undertaking public engagements and official visits, and of course at Balmoral too. Some in full military uniform, many claiming to be the Queen's long-lost second cousin, and some of course were the genuine thing. A light-hearted moment of reminiscing, but one that reflects a life of military precision. Every public engagement planned, coordinated, rehearsed, tweaked 
and diligently undertaken. And while the debate over the cost to the public purse continues, there is absolutely no question as to the contribution the Queen has made to the lives of many who hold a special place in their lives for her, but also local groups, charities, organisations, businesses and many others that have benefited from her popularity and presence. Members will all have their own memories of the Queen visiting their constituencies and regions. This is no less the case in Aberdeen, where she visited in the 60s during an outbreak of typhoid, the 70s when she pressed the button to start oil flowing from the North Sea to Grangemouth, 2012 to open the University of Aberdeen's Sir Duncan Rice Library, and 2017 to open the Robertson family roof garden at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. And of course, to my own constituency, visiting the Sue Ryder Deview Court Neurological Centre. And of course, her many local patronages include Voluntary Service Aberdeen and the Royal Horticultural Society of Aberdeen. So to conclude, presiding officer, I wish Her Majesty the Queen well as she celebrates such a milestone. The 70th Jubilee celebrations are a fitting acknowledgement of a life of service to others. And I do look forward to an extra bank holiday in June and hearing more about the Platinum Pudding competition. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Nicholl. I now call on Alexander Stewart to be followed by uh, Rachel Hamilton for around four minutes, Mr Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is a great privilege for me to speak in support of my colleague uh, Stephen Kerr's members' business debate in commemoration of the 70th anniversary of the session to the throne of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Sadly, however, this anniversary also marks 70 years since the death of her beloved father, King George VI. This event was the catalyst for his daughter's accession to the throne and was bestowed upon her while she was only 25. There were numerous undertakings uh, that she needs to take and the responsibility of someone so young. Almost overnight, uh, the young princess Elizabeth became queen, head of state of the United Kingdom and Great Britain, Northern Ireland, the Crown Dependencies, Overseas Territories and the head of the Commonwealth. As an aside, it's interesting to note, Deputy Presiding Officer, that the first Queen Elizabeth was also 25 when she became Queen in 1580, 1558. Queen Elizabeth, as the oldest daughter of the King, was in line to the throne and was in Kenya at the time of her father's death and swiftly returned to the United Kingdom. Before leaving, she penned many letters of apology to potential hosts for having to cancel her long-awaited visit, which was actually her father's visit. She also became the first sovereign uh, in over 200 years to assign to the throne whilst abroad. Following her coronation on the 2nd of June 1953 at Westminster Abbey, which was the setting of all coronations since 1066, Her Majesty became the 39th sovereign to be crowned and swiftly took up the mantle. Her great dignity and the journey that she has taken as Queen. She promised in a broadcast during her 21st birthday on the 21st of April uh, 1947, while on a tour to South Africa with her parents and her younger sister Margaret, that I declare before you all my whole life, whether long or short, shall be devoted to the service and the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. Service defines the Queen, the Deputy Presiding Officer. More than three and a quarter centuries before, she had spoken at the age of 18 when she joined the Auxiliary Territorial Services, the ATS. And she did that because she wanted to be part of that process. And she did not uh, take any other uh, rank other than a second subaltern because her father wanted her uh, to have an opportunity to serve. But over that time and since that time, Her Majesty's resolve, her determination, and her immeasurable loyalty to our country has shone through. The celebrations that we will see marking the monarch uh, for her 70th anniversary and the realm that she has uh, will commence uh, during this year. The first of all will be a four-day bank holiday that will take place from the 2nd to the 5th of June. The Jubilee Bank Holiday itself will have opportunity for individuals to celebrate the length and breadth of the country. And in addition, we will see the Queen's Green Canopy, a unique tree planting initiative created to invite people across the United Kingdom to plant trees for the Jubilee. 
The platinum pudding competition has already been mentioned, and that will be chaired by the celebrity chef, uh, Mary Berry. And there will be the big lunch opportunity, uh, the big jubilee lunch, uh, which commemorates uh, and will give opportunities to individuals, as I say, the length and the breadth, to encourage communities to get together, to know each other better. There will be many other events that will take place across the country, and we will all, I'm sure, participate in our own constituencies, in our own regions, and across the country. So, in conclusion, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I very much welcome the Queen's words during the Platinum Jubilee message last Saturday, the 5th of February, when she said that she would mark this anniversary, and it gives her great pleasure to renew to our country the pledge she gave in 1947, that her entire life will always be devoted to our service. And echoing her, I very much hope, especially during this time of division, that this jubilee will bring families, will bring friends, will bring neighbours and communities closer together, all as one. Thank you, President <laughs> Officer. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. I now call on Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Jackie Bailey for around four minutes. Ms. Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to my colleague Stephen Kerr for bringing this important debate to the Chamber. Remarkably, the Queen is the only British monarch to reach the 70 year milestone, surpassing Queen Victoria's 63 years and 216 days, and joining a small handful of kings and queens around the world. As we've heard from other people in the Chamber today, Princess Elizabeth was in Kenya when she heard the news that her father had died. Just 25, she flew home, knowing that her private life would never truly be her own again. Her husband, Prince Philip, would never finish his naval career, but would take on the role as her selfless consort. She knew how important this role would be, having witnessed her mother dedicate the same sense of duty to her father during his reign. Over the last 70 years, the Queen has shaped her role as head of state to 15 sovereign countries, and over seven decades, she's seen extraordinary social, cultural and technological progress. She has responded extraordinarily to difficult situations. She has been calming and reassuring, and she's reassured us certainly during the COVID crisis that we faced, and a fine example uh, she, she was at that point to us all. In Hollywood's magazine, uh, in the February edition, I was asked who I would invite to my fantasy dinner party, and of course I said the Queen. But to women and girls across the world, she is an inspiration as a leader, a proud mother, eager conservationist and dedicated philanthropist. The Queen is so popular that the Royal Palace this year advertised for a new full-time employee to read the postback and provide a timely and welcome response to the well wishes from thousands of long-term admirers. Her unwavering devotion to the country is unparalleled by any other monarch or world leader. Therefore, isn't it ironic that everyone else gets a holiday to celebrate her extraordinary work, hard work, commitment and service? During the time I have, the short time I have, I want to briefly touch on the Queen's love of countryside and animals. It's no secret that the Queen loves horses. She's been an avid equestrian and was famously photographed riding one of her fell ponies in 2008, aged 92. Her interest in fell ponies, a British native breed, dates back to her early childhood. But fell ponies aren't the Queen's only love. She also raised Highland ponies under the Balmoral prefix and Shetland ponies. While Shetland ponies uh, need no introduction in the United States, the Highland pony is very rare. In Scotland, the Highland pony was historically used on small farms and it was Queen Victoria's interest in the breed that sparked the royal family's association with the Highland ponies. But lest you think that the Queen only enjoys diminutive equine species, be assured that she's also fond of the thoroughbred horse. She attends each week of the uh, week-long Royal Ascot event, and she has bred many thoroughbreds and achieved success in racing over the years. And the royal farms also are home to a trio of cattle breeds, the Highland, the Jersey and the Sussex. And the Queen has raised Highland cattle since 1953 at her home at Balmoral, whilst her Sussex cattle reside at her estate in Windsor. Farming and the countryside has always been the passion of the Queen, uh, with her spending a considerable amount of time in Scotland at Balmoral or Sandringham as well. It is therefore a fitting tribute that British farmers are being invited to light beacons across the country at 9.15pm on the 2nd of June to mark the Queen's Platinum Jubilee and around 1,500 beacons will be lit right across the UK to support the celebrations across the four-day bank holiday weekend. In conclusion, uh, Presiding Officer, I 
want to reflect on the words shared by the Queen when she opened the Borders Railway as the longest reigning monarch in 2015. She said, inevitably, a long life can pass by many milestones. My own is no exception. In her Platinum Jubilee, may we all wish Her Majesty the Queen good health and thank her for her selfless duty throughout her fantastic 70 years of reign. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hamilton. I now call on Jackie Bailey to be followed by Tess White for around four minutes, Ms. Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I also start by congratulating Stephen Kerr on securing this important debate this evening and commend him for the content of his speech. Let me also add my congratulations to Her Majesty the Queen as she celebrates the 70th anniversary of her accession to the throne. This is a monumental achievement for a British monarch, unlikely to ever be repeated. And as Stephen Kerr reminded us, she's endured 14 prime ministers so far. <laughs> Our country has changed so dramatically over the last 70 years. In 1952, the average cost to buy a house was just under £2,000. Now it's almost 100 times greater. Forget mobile phones, and only around 14% of households even had a landline, and the country would still have to cope with food rationing for a further two years. There was no Netflix. And in fact, there wasn't even colour TV. So that is all unimaginable to us today. But the one constant that our country has had throughout has been Her Majesty. And she hasn't just been a constant for those born and brought up in the UK, because members may be aware that I was born and grew up in Hong Kong. And as Hong Kong remained a British colony until 1997, the Queen was very much regarded as their monarch too. She was, in fact, the first ever British monarch to visit Hong Kong in 1975, which, I have to tell you, caused huge excitement, which I remember, not least for me, at the tender age of 11. Please don't get your calculators out to work out how old I am now. But she was accompanied on that visit, as with so many other visits, state openings and trips, by her husband, Prince Philip. And I can't begin to imagine the strain that was put on such a young couple, um, their new marriage, when the 25-year-old Princess Elizabeth suddenly became queen, following the untimely death of King George VI. Together, they went through incredible highs and lows, both in their roles as heads of state and as parents, grandparents and great-grandparents. And not that we need any more evidence of Her Majesty's exceptional taste and impeccable judgment in visiting Hong Kong, but let me be parochial for a moment, because the Chamber may be interested to know that very shortly after succeeding to the throne, in 1953, Her Majesty visited the wonderful constituency of, and you guessed it, Dumbarton. The new monarch arrived by train into Dumbarton East train station, no doubt on a service much more reliable than those which go through the station today, but she was welcomed by 5,000 cheering local school children. As I would encourage everyone to do, Her Majesty and Prince Philip took in the many sights that my constituency has to offer and ended the day visiting the historic Dumbarton Castle. She was, in fact, the first British monarch to visit the area since her great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria, visited Dumbarton in 1867. And, as any visitor to Dumbarton will tell you, one trip is never enough. That's why Her Majesty and Prince Philip returned to Dumbarton in 1965, this time taking a trip on the Maid of the Loch paddle steamer up Loch Lomond, visiting Helensborough and meeting with the doctors and nurses at the Vale of Leven Hospital. Her Majesty returned again to open the new Chivas Regal bottling plant at Kilmerled and, I'm told, enjoyed a wee sample. Now, there is an ever-dwindling group of us in this chamber who have been here since 1999, which means there are few who have attended more state openings in the Scottish Parliament than myself. When Her Majesty opened the building that we are in today, she described the Scottish Parliament as a landmark for 21st century democracy. At the most recent state opening in October last year, Her Majesty spoke of her deep and abiding affection for Scotland. And these are feelings that, I'm sure we can agree, are entirely reciprocated. So on behalf of the Scottish Labour Party, I wish to thank Her Majesty for the 70 years of dedication and commitment that she has given to serving her people and country. And we wish her the very best on her platinum anniversary.
Thank you, Ms Bailey. I now call on Tess White to be followed by Brian Whittle for in four minutes. Ms White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's an honour today to celebrate the 70-year reign of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in our history. I pay tribute to my colleague Stephen Kerr for securing the time for this debate. We all know the history of our Queen and her love for Scotland. She's descended from the Royal House of Stuart on both sides of her family. She spent many summers at Balmoral, Ca Bal Balmoral Castle in Royal Deeside, Aberdeenshire in my region. So many of us, our parents and our grandparents, have family memories of events in the last 70 years. As a little girl, I remember the silver anniversary in 1977 and more recently the Diamond Jubilee in 2012. It was a time of national celebration and affection. From as far back as the Second World War, the Queen has been the country's constant servant, unrelentingly dedicated to her work, even at the age of 95. Since she came to the throne, the Queen has sent almost 300,000 100 birthday messages and close to 900,000 diamond wedding anniversary cards. What I'd like to do today is share a personal history of two photographs and two certificates hanging on the wall in my home. For my family, like so many others, they represent how Her Majesty the Queen and the Royal Family are so often interwoven in our stories and histories. The two certificates proudly hanging in our hallway speak of the hard work, learning and service to others. One of the certificates is the Duke of Edinburgh's Gold Award presented by the Queen's Consort, who stood by her side for most of the 70 years of her reign. The other, the Girls Brigade Queen's Award. One presented at the Palace of Holyrood by Prince Philip and, the, and Queen Elizabeth, and the other presented in Dundee both special life events for my wife and her family, as for so many young people in the Girls' Brigade, Boys' Brigade, Guides and Scouts. There are two photographs in the entrance hall. Ishbel, a florist all her life, regularly made the arrangements for the launch days of ships in the Clyde from where she worked on Buchanan Street. In 1959, one of Ishbel's arrangements became the Queen Mother's Christmas card that year. That picture, <laughs> that picture proudly hangs in our home. And the other, my wife's parents, George and Ishbel, who are watching today, celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary in 2018, were personally presented by the Lord Lieutenant of Lanarkshire, Lady Susan Hawhey, with a diamond wedding anniversary card for her, from Her Majesty the Queen. That day was a celebration of their life and one made memorable by the Queen and her representatives. I'd like to take a moment also to acknowledge Lord Lieutenants who work in a voluntary capacity to represent the Queen in communities across the UK. Last week I was delighted to meet the Lord Lieutenant of King Cardenshire, Alistair McPhee, and to learn about his role. George and Ishbel, now in their late 80s, are so fond of these pictures. And they make sure they had pride of place when they came to live with us when COVID-19 hit. The pictures give them daily joy. So I suggest today, it's not just Her Majesty the Queen's life and reign we celebrate. It's those personal family ties and celebrated moments that bring us all together as one nation and one family. Thank you. Thank you, well done. Uh, Ms White, before calling the next speaker, I'm conscious of the number of um, colleagues who still want to contribute to the debate, so I'm uh, minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. And I invite Stephen Kerr to move such a motion. Moved. Thank you. Uh, are we all agreed um, that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes? Yes. Excellent. Right. That is agreed. Uh, and I call the next speaker, which is Brian Whittle, uh, to be followed by James Dornan for around four minutes, Mr Whittle. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank Stephen Kerr for bringing this debate to the Chamber and, and allowing me uh, to sneak in and uh, make a few comments uh, on 
uh, 70 years of ascension of the Queen uh, uh, to the throne. Um, as, as has already been said, it was, it was, she was in Kenya at the time, uh, I think in the, the, the treetops of Tell in Kenya, um, when she heard early in the morning of the death of Father King George VI, February 6, 1952. She was a young woman then, and much, but who had, uh, had much of her teenage years had been mired in World War II. But when she, uh, her ascension to the throne, she has, during that period of time, she has seen, as we've heard, 14 prime ministers. She's seen 13 US presidents during her reign, uh, starting with, incredibly, Winston Churchill and Harry S. Truman. Her role in diplomatic relations cannot be overstated having welcomed so many world leaders to the United Kingdom, some very controversial, you would say, and her tireless travels representing our country. And the warm welcome she receives wherever she goes is testament to her world standing and the way she can bring communities together, as I think as, as Stephen Kerr said. And I often think, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, that sometimes she is valued and welcomed around the world more than from, by some of her own subjects here in the United Kingdom. Presenting officer, I, I have met, I've been lucky enough to have met Her Majesty on several occasions, starting way back in 1986 at the Commonwealth Games in Edinburgh, standing in line a, a young hairy Scots boy in a kilt, was extremely nervous about what I could possibly say to Her Majesty. But presenting officer, I needn't have worried. Her Majesty has the ability to engage with anyone, uh, be that a young athlete uh, to heads of state and making them feel special, making them feel they are the only one in the room. It is a remarkable gift from quite a remarkable lady. We owe her a huge debt of gratitude for a lifetime of service to her country, and I'm glad I've had the opportunity, just for a couple of minutes, to pass on my, my best wishes to Her Majesty the Queen, Deputy Presenting Officer. Thank you, Mr Whittle. I now call on James Dornan, who joins us remotely, to be followed by Pam Gosell for around four minutes, Mr Dornan. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'd like to thank Stephen Kerr for bringing this motion to the Chamber. And I'd also like to start by wishing Queen Elizabeth the very best after 70 years in public life. Surely at the age of 95 and having just lost her husband of many years, she's entitled now to some time for a bit of peace and quiet. Having said all that, and meaning it sincerely, I do have to speak on behalf of the half of Scotland that supports the Republic and wonder why we're having this motion in this place at this time. It appears to me that this is primarily a motion congratulating longevity. Surely, if that's the case, then we all have others, as if not more, worthy of this accolade. Take my mother. Next year, when the Queen celebrates her 70th anniversary of her coronation, my mum will be celebrating the 70th anniversary of my birth. Whilst the Queen has had every support known to mankind during the last 70 years, my mum and dad brought me and my two young brothers up firstly in a single end, then a room and kitchen, struggling to make ends meet with low and sometimes no wages. So I ask again, what is so special that, about any single individual that deserves this motion? The Queen has been very fortunate in, in that she does not have a difficult life. She has a life of, of public service, and I accept that, and it can't always be easy. But there's not many royals that are willing to swap places with people who are benefits of the other benefit system. The one that doesn't treat you as if you're special, but as if you're less than human, and should be grateful for the pittance that the state gives you to try to exist on. The Queen, like all of us, has a family full of flaws. I'm always a bit bemused at the, the reverence bestowed on this one family. However, given that that rev reverence exists, I do wonder about the hypocrisy of the Tories, though. This motion comes from the party that lied to the Queen to get Parliament illegally prorogued, had a couple of parties as she mourned, and then waited to bury her husband, and then they have the gall to submit this motion. I make no bones about the fact that I believe in a republic. No family should have the right to be treated as superior because of an accident of birth. They're simply people hampered by this class-ridden society, but still only people. The UK, as is clear from the narrow range of schooling of so many of our leaders, is still a class-based society, to the detriment of those at the bottom end of this skewed measurement of work. The Queen is, of course, 
at the peak of this pyramid of entitlement. We have a housing crisis whilst they have multiple houses with massive lands attached. We have food banks whilst they have banquets. We have people on benefit chased up for every penny whilst they are given tax breaks to protect their wealth and property. Mr Dornan, I I've got a point. Mr Dornan, could I just stop you briefly? I've got a point of order in the chamber. Point of order, Rachel Hamilton. Yeah, OK. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I do believe that Mr Dornan has gone slightly off topic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that <laughs> is a point of order, and I don't believe that he has deviated from the topic, even if he's deviated from the spirit of the other contributions in the debate. Mr Dornan. Yes, I'm happy to accept both those points. I read that the Queen is considering retiring next year, and that makes perfect sense to me. However, at that point, the debate should not be, should we skip a generation because we don't like Charles and Camilla and do like Will and Kate? It should be, has the anachronism that is the royal family run its natural course, and is it time for a republic? Signing off, sir, I respect anyone who's continued to work until the age she has, and I sincerely wish her well. But it's time that Scotland and the rest of the UK had a grown-up debate about how we wish to be perceived as subjects of Charles and Camilla, or citizens in a Scottish republic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Dornan. I now call on Pam Gosell to be followed by Megan Gallagher for around four minutes. Ms Gosell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am honoured to contribute to today's Members' Business Motion, rightly brought to Parliament by my colleague Stephen Kerr. I would like to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the accession to the throne of Her Majesty the Queen, not only as our longest reigning monarch, but as an inspiration woman across the world. Her Majesty's professional accomplishments are something to be marvelled. So we often forget how she has been a champion in paving the way for the modern woman. Her Majesty has been a wife, a mother, a grandmother, yet garnered the respect of world leaders at a time when it was still uncommon for women to be in a leading role let alone head off an entire nation and the Commonwealth. As a young woman, she was thrown into a role that carries immense responsibility and yet has never second-guessed her decision to put the crown and country first. She has been a constant source of stability, comfort, identity and inspiration for the whole nation. Her Majesty is an expert in many things and has a great sense of humour and is exceptionally quick-witted. And while most of us will never get the chance to know her personally, doesn't it feel like we all do know her in some level? Her Majesty stands at the heart of British values and at the core of our identity as a nation. I know I do not just speak for myself when I say that Her Majesty is an inspiration to all of us women. As we approach International Women's Day next month, Her Majesty, the perfect role model that many women like myself look up to, Her Majesty has become an icon for women. She earned the respect of the entire nations by proving that she is a born leader, intelligent, diplomatic, and level-headed. And we need not even consider her gender, for it has never stood in her way. Her Majesty is quietly powerful, for we need not hear from her how she has normalised female leaders. We see it. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, I hope everyone in this chamber will join me in congratulating her Majesty, on her 70 years of loyal service. To me, she is not just a leader. She is the mother of the United Kingdom. Thank you, Ms Gosal. And I call the final speaker in the open day debate, Megan Gallagher, for around four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to thank my colleague Stephen Kerr for bringing this debate to the Chamber so that we can all join together in celebrating this remarkable achievement of a Platinum Jubilee for Her Majesty the Queen. Her Majesty has become the first British monarch to have reigned for 70 years, and in that time there has been many extraordinary firsts. On the 23rd of May 1953, 
Everest was conquered for the first time by Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay. News of this incredible achievement would reach the United Kingdom on the morning of Her Majesty's official, official coronation on the 2nd of June 1953. In 1969, Neil Armstrong became the first human to walk the surface of the moon. On the 9th of November 1989, the Berlin Wall came crashing down in a resounding victory for freedom and democracy that was rejoiced the world over. There was also advancements in technology, medicine, human rights, international trade and global travel. The selfless dedication to duty, a commitment to upholding the values of freedom and democracy, are a testament to everything that Her Majesty seeks to achieve in her daily life. The list of titles and responsibilities invested in Her Majesty would be enough to fill this chamber ten times over, and for that reason I will pick out one or two due to the time I have this evening. As Head of the British Armed Forces, Her Majesty has overseen the finest military men and women the world has ever seen. Our military personnel hold a very special place in the heart of the nation, and throughout the last 70 years, these traditions have been expertly handled by Her Majesty in her role as Commander-in-Chief of the British Armed Forces. For many, Trooping the Colour has always been a special highlight of the British summer. However, for me personally, the event that is clearest in my memories is having watched Her Majesty lead the nation in Remembrance Day services at the Cenotaph. And then there is Her Majesty's close and personal connection with Scotland. Here, Her Majesty is known as the Chief of Chiefs, and it's always a pleasure to see the Royal Company of Archers Resplendent in their uniforms of green velvet providing an official bodyguard on state visits, such as the reopening of our own Scottish Parliament that we all attended a few months ago. However, it's not the official state visits that are most clearest in my memories. What stands out is the footage of Her Majesty Prince Philip and her young family at Barnmoral enjoying many happy days here at home in the Scottish Highlands. The love and affection that Her Majesty holds for Scotland is unrivalled, and we, all have, we have always held a special place in Her Majesty's heart. It is important that we remember Her Majesty's words always, and I quote, I have spoken before of my deep and abiding affection for this wonderful country and of the many happy memories Prince Philip and I always held of our time here. It is often said that it is the people that make a place and there are few places where this is truer than in Scotland, as we have seen in recent times. Presiding officer, I will close by echoing the words of David Cameron, who, as Prime Minister, eloquently led the House of Commons on the occasion of Her Majesty's Diamond Jubilee celebration. And he said, on her first address to the nation as Queen, Her Majesty pledged that throughout all her life and with all her heart, she would strive to be worthy of the people's trust. This she achieved beyond question. The nation holds her in its heart, not just as the figurehead of an institution, but as an individual who has served this country with unerring grace, dignity and decency. I think we can all agree there is no finer tribute to Her Majesty on her platinum jubilee. God save the Queen. Thank you, Ms Gallagher. I now call on the Cabinet Secretary to respond to the debate. A, a generous seven minutes. Uh, Thank Secretary. you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And my first of all... Congratulate Stephen Kerr for securing this debate and for his speech. It's a rare event. I think that I agree <laughs> with every word that he uh, spoken in his address. I'm pleased to take part in this evening's uh, proceedings as the Scottish Government Minister with responsibility for the Royal Household, uh, as a member of Her Majesty's uh, Privy Council and as a member of the Scottish Cabinet, which uh, this week sent its appreciation for the long and distinguished service uh, of our Head of State. Uh, this evening's debate allows me to provide a brief update to the Parliament on this year's Platinum Jubilee in Scotland and to reconfirm the Scottish Government's recognition and commendation of Her Majesty the Queen's remarkable legacy and dedication to duty during the 70 years uh, of, of her reign here and in the 15 other independent states around the world where she is Head of State, including Canada, Australia and New Zealand. Her Majesty the Queen is bound to Scotland by ties of both ancestry and uh, affection. It's already been noted, a direct descendant uh, of the Royal House of Stuart on both sides of her family. Her personal relationship with the people of Scotland uh, and our country began in childhood and has deepened during her many private and official visits during the seven decades of her reign. Uh, this is an apt time to recall some of the milestones of Her Majesty's visits and engagements in Scotland 
uh, through the last seven decades. Her Majesty's first state visit to Scotland as Queen came on the 24th of June 1953, just weeks after the coronation. Cheering crowds witnessed a magnificent procession accompanying the royal carriage bearing uh, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh to St Giles for a national service of thanksgiving. There, for the first time since 1822, the honours of Scotland were carried before the monarch and presented to Her Majesty. In September 1967, saw Her Majesty visit John Brown's shipyard at Clyde Bank, birthplace of uh, the Royal Yacht Britannia, RMS Queen Mary and RMS Queen Elizabeth. Uh, on this occasion, she christened the new Cunard liner uh, the QE2. In 1977, it was the year of Her Majesty's Silver uh, Jubilee, and in Glasgow, around 200,000 people welcomed her on her tour of Scotland. Further north in Dundee, 10,000 Dundonians waved as she passed through, and I'm told in Aberdeen the crowds waiting to see her were 20 deep on the pavements. On the 24th of July 1986, Her Majesty opened the Commonwealth Games here in Edinburgh, an undertaking she performed again in 2014 when Glasgow hosted uh, the Games. And in July 1999, which saw the return of Scotland's Parliament uh, for the first time in nearly 300 years, Her Majesty formally opened the Parliament, then housed in the General Assembly Hall, and gifted a specially commissioned mace, which stands before us, uh, marking the Parliament's authority. In her speech, she commented, this uh, a society in which the qualities of cooperation, learning, entrepreneurial skill and national pride run deep, before also mentioning the grit, the determination, humour and forth forthrightness, and above all the strong sense of identity of the Scottish people, all qualities which occupy a personal place in her own and her family's affections. In 2002, the Golden Jubilee year, Her Majesty visited Scotland opening the Jubilee Wheel at the Millennium Link in Falkirk and the Space Scottish School of Contemporary Dance in Dundee. She travelled to the Isle of Skye and to Lewis and attended the Borders gathering at Melrose. The 2010s saw Her Majesty open major infrastructures which have benefited the people of Scotland. In 2015, saw the opening of the Borders Railway, the Queen's Ferry Crossing, uh, was officially opened by her in September 2017. This was also the decade of Her Majesty's Di uh, Diamond Jubilee when 2012 saw Perth have its city status restored by the Queen. Most recently, there has never been a clear indication of Her Majesty's selfless dedication to duty and her love of Scotland and its people than her attendance at the opening of the sixth session of the Scottish Parliament in October last year, just a few short months after she lost her consort of 73 years. Her Majesty congratulated Parliament for marking the new session safely in a very trying period, in her words, while noting that Parliament had been at the heart of Scotland's response to the pandemic. Her Majesty then told the Chamber of her deep and abiding affection for this wonderful country and of the many happy memories she held of her time here. She added that the new session brought a sense of beginning and renewal and urged us all to work together despite any differences of opinion. We strongly hope to see Her Majesty again in the summer of this year during Royal Week while she's in residence at the Palace of Holyrood House and holding summer court at Balmoral. Throughout her reign, the Queen has demonstrated commitment and support to a diverse group of organisations spanning the length and the breadth of Scotland. This various, various uh, list includes the Aberdeen Association of Social Service, the Highland Association and Coman Gaeltacht, uh, the Peabroth Society, the Royal Caledonian Curling Club, the Scottish Football Association, the Royal Scottish National Orchestra, I could go on. Her Majesty also holds a number of appointments within the armed forces in Scotland, including being Colonel-in-Chief of both the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards and the Royal Regiment of Scotland. Through these patronages, Her Majesty has provided vital publicity for the work of these organisations and allows their enormous achievements and contributions to society to be recognised. Her Majesty is one of the longest serving monarchs in the world ever, having recently overtaken that of Emperor Franz Josef of Austro-Hungary. This year will see her Platinum Jubilee celebrated throughout the land. We have ensured that the people of Scotland have access to the long weekend in early June in which to enjoy community-led events. These include the Big Lunch, dedicated Highland Games, Guinness World Record attempts, and we will also see the return from previous events of the lighting of beacons. I have recently been advised that a tune composed for the occasion by Piper Stuart Liddell of Inverary will be played throughout the Commonwealth as the sun sets on June the 2nd. There is also great engagement with the Queen's Green Canopy as this initiative to plant a tree for the Jubilee 
has been taken forward by schools, by communities, by scout and guide troops and individuals, to name but a few. Plantings range from single trees to platinum crowns of silver birch, and the dedication of ancient trees to the Platinum Jubilee all will be an enhancement and a benefit to their local areas. We are indebted to the work carried out by Scottish Lord Lieutenants, community and local councils and local authorities in engaging with their communities and developing all of these activities. Her Majesty's selfless dedication to and affection for Scotland and its people as Head of State and a steadfast friend of our Parliament since its establishment in 1999 is beyond question. Her Majesty the Queen has led us forward through remarkable innovations, such as can be seen in technology and medicine, while providing a firm foundation for us through the difficulties of a changing climate and a worldwide pandemic. I'd like to invite the Chamber to join me in noting our respect for Her Majesty the Queen's immeasurable dedication and affection for Scotland and its people, and in offering our unreserved thanks for her selfless and dutiful service to our country. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate, and I close this meeting of Parliament.